Hi there and welcome to our Small Acreage webinar on considerations for raising chickens in the mountains. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acreage Management Coordinator for the Front Range in Colorado. And I'm happy to have Eric McPhail with us today. He's the Director for Gunnison County Extension. So he'll be presenting this afternoon. Before I turn things over to him, if you're new to webinars, I just want to point out that there's a chat box on the left-hand corner of your screen. So this is the place that you can ask questions or make comments to Eric as he presents. Um, after his presentation, he'll also have plenty of time for question and answer. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Small Acreage Management website. And I'll send everybody a link to that later today or, or tomorrow. And I'd also like to thank Colorado State University Extension and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for making this webinar possible. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Eric. Thanks, Jennifer. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get started in just a second. I'm going to ask a few questions just to get, get going on um, uh, a few introductory questions and then, and then I'll start with the presentation and probably pause my, my camera and, so you don't have to sit here and watch me. But I am presenting to you from a beautiful sunny day in Gunnison, Colorado. I uh, hope everyone one else is having a nice day where they're at. Um, but so to start off, a little bit of background. Um, I came from Texas to Extension about about eight years ago, and um, really this whole chicken craze has come about in the last five years here and, and quadrupled. Um, it seems like nearly every year with the backyard chickens and more and more people raising chickens and. Um, really and truly for that reason alone and uh, my job just becoming more and more questions about poultry uh, I started uh, uh, doing a lot of poultry presentations for people uh, so with that if you could take a second everybody and um, answer these three questions for us uh, play, please rate your knowledge about raising chickens in the mountains um, and currently do you have chickens um, and then just real quick how did you hear about this webinar answering those questions will, will help us out a lot as we evaluate these webinars and and, um, and see if we're going to continue them into the future so it's a great easy economical way to get me from Gunnison Colorado here in my office all the way to you guys And as far as on the um, on your questions, I know going through uh, presentation, it's a little bit hard because I'm on the web. But um, if we could just hold your questions till the end, and then I'll sure leave at least 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions. Um, and we'll do that with the chat box below because I can't hear you or see you. But um, we'll do that with the chat box below, um, and um, and I'll for sure leave plenty of time at the end. All right. So thanks for answering those questions. Looks like we kind of had a mixture of, uh, of uh, OP, some having chickens, some not having chickens, and, and the stages of, of uh, raising poultry that you're at. So I always kind of start this out. Um, I call this presentation Taking the Fowl Out of Poultry. Um, I pray for the day when chickens can cross a road without their motives being questioned. I don't know who said that, but I found that in Florida one time and I thought that was kind of a cute saying. 
And if you, if you asked me, um, if you would have asked me probably five years ago about raising chickens, I, I was never one to really even like chickens. I grew up as a cattle rancher in Texas, and, and uh, chickens to me were always kind of, uh, who in the world would raise a chicken? I mean, especially if you look at this chicken here on the right. Um, and that's one of my chickens now, by the way. But it's like, why would I have that bird? Um, you know, chickens, after I got them, uh, and I did probably get into the chicken business a little bit, just because I was at Murdoch's one day and had a weak moment with the kids. And the kids were like, we want these, we want these. And I said, fine, let's get some chickens. And a lot of you, that may be how you started out in the chicken business, is pleasing your kids. And, and chickens are fun. Um, they can do a lot for you. They can be a good pest control measure. They can uh, raise a good source of eggs for you or meat. Uh, there's just tons of, of uh, fun things that chickens can provide your family. Um, and, you know, they're not as... Uh, Oh, they're not as, as dirty as people might think they are, um, and, and, and labor-intensive. For all practical purposes, the chickens that I have, it takes about five minutes a day, if that, uh, for me to take care of them. But I think there's some important things uh, we need to get into. Um, first off, I want to start talking to you a little bit about eggs. Uh, we'll go over some regulations. We'll talk about uh, a few questions. We'll kind of hit the a lot of the... Uh, oh, hard stuff that you need, and then we'll get into some of the management of poultry uh, in the mountains in just a second. Um. Okay, not sure what happened. Uh, hopefully I'm back up and going. Is that better? That's one of the things with the webinars. It's, uh, uh, there's no telling. And I'm on a county uh, network, so it could just drop me out anytime. So I apologize for that. Um, uh, so here we go. Uh, back to eggs. Let's just get started because I've got a lot of slides to go through. One thing that the that the girl that's uh, down here in the right corner is uh, doing is soaking her eggs, and that's sure something that I probably don't agree with a whole lot. But uh, nonetheless, I love to see children taking part in it and helping with the chores. So a couple things on eggs. Now we got white egg layers and and uh, brown egg layers and and um, and really and truly, uh, if you just want a quick thing to know about which type of birds lay what color eggs, if you look at their ear lobes, that's always a good indicator. If they have white ear lobes, then um, then um, they'll be raising white eggs. If they have the red ear lobes, then um, then they'll end up having brown eggs. Uh, some of the blue and the green, uh, the green egg layers are your Americanas and Aracanas, and, and there's just a plethora um, of different types of, of chickens out there. When we get to the egg terms, um, I think we, we have a lot of misunderstood terms out there, uh, and especially for the homeowner and the consumer, it's kind of hard. Uh, but what we do is, when we look at uh, some of the egg terms, you've got natural, uh, I'm having trouble getting my camera up and going, let's see, which is really distracting, but hopefully that will be better. And, and we will talk about raising some different chicken breeds in the mountains in just a second, but I wanted to cover for a lot of you the egg terms that are out there. Um, so we've got natural, 
Uh, that just kind of, for most people, means no antibiotics in feed, but it really can mean anything in the world. Organic does require a certification, so if someone's calling their eggs organic, then, then uh, they kind of have to go through a process where they have to certify that all their uh, feed's organic and, and that they haven't given their chickens any antibiotics or anything. That can be really hard to do since a lot of the chickens and poultry diets are mainly made up of soybeans and corn. Uh, it's kind of hard to get those products in an all-organic uh, feed. However, uh, most of the feed stores now are listening to people and, and um, listening to the, the producers and consumers and, and really trying to offer organic feeds on their shelves. So it's making it easier. Pasture raised is, is kind of misunderstood a lot. Um, that can mean quite a few things to quite a few different people. Um, you know, really and truly, it's great to have the, the chickens out on the pasture. They do a lot of things. They kind of scratch around, uh, help till up the ground. They fertilize the ground. It tries to be a situation where you can put a bunch of birds in a little area and then move them all around the pastures. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have tons of room to move around the pastures, but in some cases it does. A big thing is is that our chickens really don't uh, rely totally on a, a bird and uh, or a, a diet of, of uh, bugs. That they do actually have to have uh, some more nutrients in their body besides the insects and the worms and so forth. When you get into the cage free, uh, that's that can basically just mean that that um, uh, they're not in a real real tight cage. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that. They're not in a cage because you could consider uh, your chicken coop a cage, but it usually typically means that they have a little more space to spread out their wings and get going um, and have enough room that if the other birds start pecking on them, they can get away freely. Um, but that cage free is, is so widely used uh, out in the industry now. Uh, and then farm fresh, and farm fresh just typically means that it comes straight from the farm. Uh, but what is a farm? Uh, what is fresh? You know, they may have came from your local na your neighbor. However, maybe they're two months old. Um, farm fresh uh, is kind of also kind of a mis misnomer, I guess. When uh, when we get into these egg regulations, um, there's a few things to start thinking about because uh, a lot of people are starting to raise eggs uh, and and selling them and trying to sell them and, and getting big enough where they're selling them at farmers markets and, and more so than just to their neighbor or giving them to their neighbor. Uh, retail only, uh, that's a term that means the eggs come directly from the producer. And so if you're giving those eggs directly to somebody, you are the retailer. Um, you know, a big cutoff that we have is this 3,000 eggs or 250 dozen a month. Uh, this is a cutoff that kind of exempts you from a lot of things, whether we're dealing with the Cottage Food Act or we're dealing with the Colorado Department of Ag regulations. Um, and so, you know, keep in mind that's about 100 birds laying a, an egg a day. And so if you got less than 100 birds, then you're probably never going to hit this target. Um, if you have 200 uh, birds, then you might. Um, so a lot of the restrictions... Uh, if you have less than 100 birds, you're going to be exempt from the Colorado Department of Ag regulations and to some extent some of the, uh, the environmental health uh, or public health uh, regulations as well and licensing things. Um, egg washing is a huge thing right now. To wash or not to wash, that's the question. Um, you know, there's so much information out there. Um, I'm not going to be the food safety police on you, but um, you get into a situation where, uh, you know, you've got this, this, this egg that comes out of the chicken, for the most part with a nice clean um, film over it that really kind of tries to prevent a lot of bacteria from going into the egg. However, if you leave it too long in the nest, you got other uh, birds sitting on it, getting it soiled, getting it dirty, and uh, then you kind of start building up this uh, bacterial problem that could be on the eggs. You take them inside, uh, do you wash them or not? Um, I, I say yes, wash every egg. Um, you know, but keep in mind that there is a little protective barrier 
on, on that egg. And if you wash it too much, then you're pulling that barrier off and allowing uh, bigger pores in that egg. And, and uh, you could run the risk of that egg uh, going bad a little sooner. Now, um, you know, but dirty eggs do pose a health problem. And a quick way um, is to get the hot water and, and rinse the eggs off. You can use some dishwasher detergent and something that's not fragrant. You don't want the fragrance of your of your uh, uh, of your eggs of the dishwashing detergent. You don't want that fragrance going inside your eggs, and um, and you don't want to soak them. Uh, for the big thing, if you soak them, then that egg's just sitting there in water, and for the most part, the water's dirty. And if it goes inside the eggs, then then you got dirty eggs through the pores anyway. Excuse me. Um, a, real quick, and you can dip your eggs. Uh, wire baskets really help with this. If you have a wire basket and you got a dozen eggs in it that you collected for the day. You know you can fill up the little uh, your sink with with some bleach and water. Uh, dip your eggs a couple times in it and pull it out. Uh, on the hot water side, you really the idea is to keep it 20 degrees or so. Uh, warmer than your eggs are. So if you pull them out and your eggs are kind of room temperature, you know, you really need to be up there in that 100, 110 degree range because, and that's okay, that won't scald you, but it'll be as hot as your sink can, uh, as hot as you can get your sink water. But, I mean, you want to stay away from scalding yourself, but that hot water on the outside will actually uh, cause the inside of the egg to expand and kind of prevent a lot of uh, bacteria from going inside the egg. Uh, don't box your eggs while they're wet, um, just because for the most part they'll stick to the cartons and make a mess. Um, one of the easiest things to do is just leave them on, leave them in the little basket and put them in the fridge, um, and go from there. Now there's a lot we we can go into a lot on washing eggs, but for the most part, uh, those are going to be my suggestions to you. Uh, when we get into some of these egg regulations and selling eggs, um, if you think about it, there's kind of two regulators or licensing uh, entities. One's the Colorado Department of Ag. Uh, they're mostly concerned with what is your product? Is it an ag product? Uh, what size are the eggs? Um, you know, how big is your operation? Uh, is it organic? These type of things. The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment is kind of that entity that, that jumps out there and says, we want to know um, you know, are you going? How are you going to meet uh, food safety measures? Are you a retail food establishment? Um, you know, you may not have the right to sell at a grocery store or so forth. And so that's kind of that entity. Always difficult um, to navigate your way through that. Uh, so if you have a pen and pencil, a uh, piece of paper, write down this website. This co farm to market.com that'll really help you navigate your way through that licensing and uh, and uh, regulation piece of selling eggs Let's see if I can get my camera back up here so some quick questions we'll just jump out and get everybody thinking about uh, how long will eggs keep in the refrigerator uh, that is a question for sure. Uh, there's been studies done that eggs can stay for a long, long time, uh, even upwards of six months uh, in the refrigerator. Uh, typically, we like to say that they'll last 30 to 45 days uh, in the refrigerator. However, um, usually what happens is, is that the eggs don't spoil, they dry out uh, at some point. And, um, and so that's where your quality loss comes into, is after that month of, of sitting drying out. Now there's lots of uh, different, different things people can do to their eggs. You can put mineral oil on them, some butter on them. You can try about a million different things to try to keep those eggs longer. Um, however, uh, really and truly the things that, it's hard to get an egg to spoil from bacteria unless they're cracked or, or something like that. And so. There's a million different thoughts on this refrigeration and, and uh, how long the eggs will actually keep in the refrigerator. Um, 
it's really all over the board and I've seen studies that you know with with eggs out on the counter all day long uh, at room temperature that they've kept forever um, and then they've kept just as long in their refrigerator so it's really all over the board and I just like to recommend uh, really try to stay in that 30 to 45 days and uh, and put them in the refrigerator as soon as you wash them. Are brown eggs better? No, the shell color doesn't make a difference in the eggs nutritional value. It doesn't affect its taste, its quality, or its cooking characteristics. A brown egg and a white egg, after you crack them, you can't tell the difference. Uh, a lot of the a lot of people with backyards, they kind of steer towards the uh, brown eggs just because it, I don't know, brown eggs they are hard to find at the grocery store and, and it kind of separates yourself a little bit if you can have one of the brown egg laying breeds. But it has nothing to do with the nutritional value of the egg that's inside. Are all eggs fertile? You know, this is just something most people know that you, that, um, that eggs to get eggs you don't have to have fer you don't have to have a rooster and you don't they don't have to be fertilized. Um, a hen is going to lay an egg no matter what. That's what her body tells her to do. Uh, that's what any female tells herself their bodies to do. Uh, the egg is going to come whether we want it to or not. Um, when you do have a rooster, however, um, there's a chance that their hens will be fertilized. Uh, there's there's no nutritional difference between the fertilized and the non-fertilized eggs. However, uh, there's a tendency for those fertilized eggs to uh, lose their quality a little bit faster. I see there's some chat, some questions coming in, and I'll sure pull those up. And if I mean, you can go ahead and put them on the chat, or you can write them down. Um, and ask them in a little bit and we'll just kind of get to them in that order uh, and I'm happy to go back I don't I want everybody to get their questions answered uh, what's that white stringy thing in my eggs uh, I get that a lot especially from the kids uh, that's the chalaza and and all that is is that little support system for that yolk and keeps the yolk centered in the egg uh, totally edible you don't have to pull it out it does not mean anything about being fertilized or not um, and a lot of times, the, the stronger that chalaza is, the, the fresher the egg. Um, why some yolks are yellow and some are orange? Well, that's kind of a vitamin question and a nutritional question for the chicken. Uh, the yolk color, quality, and firmness all directly related to the chicken's diet. Uh, the chicken's, it doesn't, I mean, a lighter colored yolk doesn't necessarily mean that that chicken is is uh, in a nutritional deficiency or anything it's more related to what it actually eats and so when you have some chickens out eating grasses and weeds and and some things with some high vitamin A content in them then uh, a lot of times those yolks will be a little orangey uh, a lot more orange than say a store-bought egg where they're primarily on a corn-based or grain-based diet um, So what are these blood spots? The tiny blood spots throw a lot of consumers off uh, and the blood spots don't indicate anything other than when that when that egg was being produced there was a little blood vessel that probably popped and, and uh, during that formation of the egg and some blood got in that egg. Um, doesn't indicate anything about if it was fertilized or not. Um, sometimes you can find it with handling and whatnot, but most of the time if you don't like that blood spot then you can just dip a little paper towel on top of it when you break it and put it in a bowl. Take the little towel, uh, dab it on that blood spot and the blood just comes right off. Uh, but there again, totally edible, not to scare, it doesn't scare anybody or anything like that. Um, I really didn't suggest a preferred diet, uh, Jane, but we'll keep going here and then we'll, I'll try to ask you more about what that question is. Uh, what are my egg whites? Uh, why are my egg whites cloudy? Uh, and this is something that's subjective too. I mean, typically the fresher the egg, the more cloudy the egg white. 
Um, that's why you don't get many cloudy eggs or egg whites when you go to the store and buy uh, uh, store-bought eggs. But uh, and really, this may or may not be the case. Uh, even the freshest of, the freshest of eggs can have a clear egg white. However, typically, if it's a cloudy one, then it 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 tends to be more fresh uh, out of the chicken. And so, but there again, it's not always the case. Totally doesn't mean anything about the quality of the white uh, or anything nutritional value-wise. So what are the best mountain breeds? Um, and I get this question a lot because a lot of people want to start raising chickens up here in Gunnison where I live. And Gunnison is debatably, uh, but according to the Weather Channel, uh, Gunnison's the coldest place in the United States, in the continental United States. We always get beat out by Barrow, Alaska, and, and then uh, we go back and forth between uh, International Falls, Minnesota as being the coldest place uh, in the nation. But um, So a lot of people that live in Gunnison, they're asking me, you know, here we are at high altitude, it's cold, you know, what are the best breeds that we can raise? And I just very frankly, after all the different breeds I've seen, uh, it comes down to whichever one you like best. Um, you know, it's just as as good of a breed if your your kid looks at it and likes it. I know that uh, that I have when I had my weak moment at Murdoch's. Um, I said, okay, well, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get uh, five of these large chickens. These hens. They're going to uh, they're the Australorps, they're black, uh, they have small combs on them, so I'm not going to worry too much about frostbite, uh, and, um, and so I'm going to really steer towards these larger, heavier body mass, more heat producing type uh, hens. Um, and so that was definitely what we were getting. Well, my six year old at the time said, Dad, I want this yellow one, Dad, I want this yellow one, and, and um, so I'm like, really? Uh, well, I don't know anything about that. It was a Welsomer, and, uh, and and I think the little thing I read on them was that they produce a pretty egg. Uh, but that was all I knew, and and um, and so we got he picked out of, of about 30 there this little yellow uh, chick called a Welsomer, and to this day that Welsomer's outproduced all the other black ones that I have, the Australorps and Obviously, I didn't know what I was talking about, and I think we find that is the case. There's so much variation within breeds and breeders, and and uh, you know, high altitude and cold. The only things I recommend are that you might consider uh, not going with some of the smallest breeds, and that's a body mass thing. Uh, you know, the larger breeds contain a little more heat during the cold. And I know in my chicken coop it's gotten down to negative 20. Uh, that's got to be pretty painful for some of the chickens. But there's some things we can talk about later uh, on helping with that. Um, and so steer away from a lot of the, the little bantams or, or some of the lighter uh, body mass breeds. Uh, when we get into the meat birds, and a lot of you may be raising uh, birds for meat, Sometimes they have a hard time with a high altitude, and we have a situation, and much like we do in our cattle uh, and ruminants up in higher elevations, uh, we can get into a situation where if they have too much of a growth quality about them, uh, like your Cornish hens and, and your muscling breeds, uh, they can start trying to really pump out or overwork themselves in the high altitude and not have enough oxygen therefore they overwork their heart and they can get some some problems like ascites and, and some different things like that so I just if you're going with the meat birds uh, you might try to you know not push them too hard on feed uh, and you may also uh, choose a breed that may be a dual purpose breed um, or something like that, something to that extent uh, because if we're, and we do have some some breeds out there that that I mean they're converting a pound and a half of feed to a pound of meat and, and uh, those guys if you're really pushing them 
they can have some trouble in the higher altitudes. Uh, so the uh, another thing is if you have the opportunity to get your chicks locally, then um, then try to do so. There's a lot of studies been done that that. Um, Oh, that, that chickens have an ability to adapt and so if you're if you've got somebody raising chicks from high altitude and they've been raised in the high altitude then uh, sure enough uh, they may be the better selection for you uh, versus to try to bring chicks that were raised in Virginia uh, up here to the high altitude and in the mountains you're putting those eggs and those chicks in a lot of stress I mean that that chick was raised in a high oxygen environment and now all of a sudden it's two or three days old and it's starved for oxygen and doesn't have a uh, real quick ability uh, much like us uh, to have enough uh, red blood cells in our blood to really uh, utilize that oxygen well. Um, frostbite's another big concern um, if you're thinking about some of the exotic breeds that have the three or four inch combs on top of their heads that may not be your best bet uh, especially when you get into uh, some of the cold winter months and uh, uh, just an easy thing to help fight frostbite is to actually put some Vaseline on those combs and and on those earlobes and wattles uh, when you're expecting it to get really cold at night all right which was first the chicken or the egg We'll end with this one. Well, it depends on probably your belief. If you believe in the Bible, then the chicken came first because in Genesis it suggests that God created all winged birds and then gave them the ability to be fruitful and increase in number. But if you don't believe in the Bible, then just flip a coin <laughs> because it's anybody's guess. Um, so that's enough with the boring question slides. Um, let's jump into housing. Uh, this, uh, this coop up here in the right top that was my coop several years ago uh, and uh, that's the little subdivision I live in on about an acre uh, and oddly enough my covenants in my subdivision tell me very plainly you are not supposed to have livestock or poultry in our subdivision that's probably the biggest thing uh, when you're thinking about building your coop is to look at your covenants, look at your regulations. Uh, whatever situation you're in, there could be a million different regulations that you have to abide by. Uh, I just so happen to know that, I mean, we don't have a homeowners association while it's in the covenants. We don't have anybody to enforce them. Uh, I went around for good measure and I talked to all the uh, neighbors, did they mind? Uh, and then they sure did don't mind afterwards when I give them fresh eggs uh, ever so often. Uh, this coop here uh, that I've got, it cost me probably $1,200 to put this in and build it as part of my um, uh, shed structure that I already had. But, um, but I just kind of tell people that that was one really expensive first egg and that all the other eggs are free. But, so you got to consider a cost factor. Uh, when you're when you're thinking about your coop and your housing for your chickens, um, one good thing about the mine, uh, I have a coop that I can keep warm, keep the water warm, uh, and keep things from freezing, and then at the same time I have a top on the coop so that the owls. We have lots of golden eagles, lots of foxes, lots of cats, lots of neighbors' dogs, and so forth. It, um, this allows me to. Uh, to have the chickens inside a, a run basically uh, where they don't have to be outside and they do come out um, usually every day I let them out to some extent or my kids do um, there's another one really nice we can start making them really as sexy as we want to in these backyard situations this one here is probably a three bird no more type coop uh, same thing with this one. These are the Egaloos. There's just a million different types of, of uh, housing available for chickens. And I, I uh, encourage you to go online and just Google images and, and look at chicken coops. Um, and the majority of them, though, will have some type of uh, area that they can stay in at night, that they can lay their eggs in and then a little run that they can come out and get some fresh air and, and uh, hang around. 
Um, and it also is kind of nice when you do need to leave for the weekend, take your family camping or whatever, you can uh, just leave them, leave them in the chicken coop and then go out in the run uh, and have plenty of room to roam around. But really and truly check, check with your neighbors, check with your um, local city covenants. Maybe you can, maybe you can't have, have chickens. Maybe you can have hens, but you can't have roosters. Uh, maybe there's noise ord ordinances in place and so forth. Uh, another thing you'll have to think about is disposal of your chickens. Uh, if you're going to have chickens, you will have a chicken that dies. Uh, are you going to treat it like a pet? Will it be buried next to the guinea pig outside? Uh, or is it going to require something where you have 10 or 15 chickens that might die? Maybe you had a little sickness go through and uh, maybe you're really thinking about more of a, of a landfill situation. Uh, just kind of get that in place, but know that sometimes that does happen, and, and if you have chickens, at some point they're, they're going to die. Uh, okay, perches. These next slides I'm going to try to go through a little bit quicker so that everybody has time to ask some questions, but uh, every coop needs a perch. Uh, the perches are really when you design your perch, think about it uh, quite a bit. You want to have enough room for the birds, but at the same time, um, you really uh, want to have some situation in your coop where you can clean underneath the coop. Uh, this is a situation where there's a newspaper and a board underneath the perch because this is where 80 to 90 percent of the poop that your chickens produce will be. And so if you have a little area that you can clean real easily, then you're not as likely to uh, really be messing up all your bedding underneath and have to clean it out uh, more. It makes it a lot easier if you have some type of, of uh, cleaning space underneath the perch. Fencing, uh, I've really uh, kind of gone towards recommending a lot of these electric fences um, because as much as we want to say that our chickens are free-range chickens and, and go out a lot and eat bugs and grass and scratch around, um, where I'm at in Gunnison, a free-range chicken is probably just free food for, uh, for the hawks and the eagles and, and, um, and the neighbor dogs and so forth. So um, what happens is, is if you have some kind of barrier, electric fence or something, that can really be helpful. Um, it may not be a situation where you let your chickens out all day long and not have them attended. These large runs uh, where you can have a top on it are very helpful. Uh, especially if you're not going to let them out. Now, one just to bring that home, uh, I had a friend that that just um, him and a bunch of his neighbors got together and they had 60 they got 60 meat birds, and they loved the idea of them being free range and, and going out and in the sagebrush and eating a lot of bugs and and having room to roam around. They thought they were doing great, um, and really in two weeks ago they went out there and said, well, there doesn't look like there's as many out there as there was. And then a week ago he said he had 20 birds left, uh, and sure enough he caught a fox going over the fence and every night probably picking off one of them. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta kinda be, the fencing is really for predator protection in a lot of ways. And not so much to keep the chickens corralled. The typical chicken won't go over 50 yards away from its coop. Uh, 50 to 100 yards is about the max distance that they like to go around from their little safe coop. Uh, I really do like this uh, netting. Uh, I think it keeps a lot of the dogs away, keeps the chickens kind of corralled in an area. If you want to move it, you can move it. Um, and it's kind of an easy, easy solution to keeping a lot of the foxes and, and or mountain lions out. It'll, it'll deter a lot of your skunks, it'll deter a lot of your raccoons, and so forth. Um, pasture poultry, this is kind of that situation that I've talked about. Um, some of this, these pasture poultry, you can have a lot of birds in a little area, and you just move these guys. You can see down here there's, there's multiple little coops, and they just keep them moving across the, the pasture, and what that does is, uh, the idea is that you're fertilizing and, and scratching and aerating the soil as you go, and so it's kind of a pasture health uh, type situation.
day range poultry is what probably most of our backyard enthusiasts will want to be uh, want to start doing and typically the growth in the in the chicken population uh, where it's where we've seen the most growth I guess uh, this is actually my coop uh, a few days ago and uh, and then this is another one just like it where you have the ability to um, have lots of room for your chickens to be inside some type of run but then also they can go in the coop lay their eggs uh, and, and roost at night and stay warm you really need to think about your snow load especially here in the mountains you can see that I have a sloping roof it goes right on to a chicken wire covered top uh, and the icicles on this thing will get extremely long uh, there'll be snow inside here uh, so and chickens don't typically like to come out that much in the snow although they will um, but you got to kind of consider that that area in there uh, that it's when the snow comes it's going to get white it may get dirty it may get nasty uh, but just keep that into consideration that you it may not be the best bet to have a roof shed right on top of, of where your chicken door is or the chickens are coming out into the run we've got another situation these chicken tractors uh, the key here is folks you need to move these um, but if you want to utilize them for what they were intended for they're kind of that pasture range situation where you are wanting to move this around and, and benefit the ground and and so forth the uh, you know in the mountains it's really tough it's it's real Oh, everybody wants to buy that little tiny chicken coop because it's so cute at, at the, the feed store or whatever. But a lot of those are going to get cold. And you're going to have to think about your water freezing and how you're going to get electricity in there. And uh, so, you know, in a situation like this, there's a lot of air underneath this uh, where the chickens are going to be at night. This is probably going to get very, very cold um, and be hard to heat. And so you got to think about those uh, those uh, situations. I'm hoping you can still hear me. On the predator control, um, we've got some some things you don't even think about. Rats are a huge problem. Uh, they can bring diseases into your nest, and they can be really trouble with your food the eagles the owls they will swoop down and take off with one quick um, and I've seen this uh, it's one of the worst things when a when a 4-H kids planning on showing his his chicken uh, at the show and then they call me and say you know what uh, we let them out and they were in the backyard and and, uh, and an eagle or something swooped down and got them uh, so we're not gonna have anything to show at the fair you know that's a tough situation uh, but it does happen and you may just have to uh, think about some of those losses that that you will incur if you let them let them out too much uh, it's always I know when I watch my chickens as soon as any bird wild bird or anything uh, squeaks or chirps and they hear it my my chickens just freeze and they immediately turn their head and look to the sky it's amazing the instinct that they have that something might swoop down and get them. Raccoons, foxes, uh, skunks. Uh, if you've got a sick bird, uh, these guys can really reach through uh, your chicken coop. They can they can grab a bird. I've, I've seen them pull a leg off a bird. I've seen them kill one um, and not uh, and not even uh, not even think twice about it. Skunks and raccoons are really troublesome on getting into uh, chicken coops. Foxes are really tough as well because they can dig down and, and go right in. And I know that's pretty basic and, and most people think about it, but um, if you don't spend time uh, with your predator control and fencing, then, then you may lose all of them one night. Uh, of course, there's always a chance that you can't bear proof a chicken coop um, unless you really just are locking them in every single night it's hard to bear proof it and because a bear will just push right through the, the chicken wire normally and go right on in so 
Think about doors on your chicken coops. Uh, do you want them open all the time? Do you want the ability to close them? When it's extremely cold, you may get some drafts going into these uh, chicken doors. You may want to close them at night. You may want to leave them open all during the summer. Uh, Ventilation is a huge problem uh, in some of these tight closed up chicken coops. I almost steer to the side of even in as cold a weather as we have here in Gunnison. Uh, lots of ventilation uh, for the birds. Weather, chickens don't mind the weather, but you got to clear a path for them and they will kind of go out there. Um, you'll notice the birds will sit right here on this looking like we don't want to go out there, we don't want to go out there. Um, and so you really got to kind of, uh, sometimes you got to push them out a little bit. Maybe you throw some bird seed on this snow, maybe you throw a little hay out there and the, the birds will go right on out um, and get some sunshine. The blackbirds love to go out in the early morning and just sit on a little perch if they can, get up high and soak up that sun. Um, so it's kind of fun, weather's not really a, a big issue. Uh, food, let's see, I'm on slide, not sure what slide I'm on, but I'm going to have to go pretty quick. Food, really and truly we've got, we've got great uh, uh, companies that make some great foods out there. They make it pretty easy. Uh, I spent some time at Texas A&M uh, designing poultry feeds and, and teaching some, some poultry feed classes, but really and truly uh, it's hard. A chicken's diet is much like our diet. Um, you know, could we survive on lettuce alone? Maybe. Uh, could the young ones? Probably not. When you get into food, they make it really easy for us at the feed store. Starter, grower, layer. If it's a meat production bird, then sure enough, uh, they have a meat producing food. Uh, typically from the egg, you got about three weeks. Um, then it hatches, you got the chick, so you're feeding the chick some starter and grower and it doesn't take very long till you're on a layer ration um, once those birds get to be about six months old to be honest. And the layer ration is where the big nutritional uh, needs really should be met. Uh, just because that layer is producing so much calcium, or taking up so much calcium to put in those eggshells that's why we feed a lot of oyster shell and different things like that. We're trying to get that calcium into uh, those birds as best we can. And so the layers need extra calcium, quite a bit more calcium to be honest. And, um, and that's why those feed formulations are really designed well uh, because once you start adding calcium and, and getting your phosphorus levels right, uh, then uh, there's, a lot to, there's a lot that can go into that. And if you are doing a lot of just free ranging of the chickens out on the grass and so forth, it is always nice to do some supplemental uh, calcium, especially on your layers. And protein as well. Uh, chickens have a little higher need for uh, one of the amino acids called lysine. Um, and the uh, poultry nutritionists that develop most of the feeds at the feed store really know this, this well. Um, Hanging feeders, uh, really that's just a situation where you always kind of want to have that feeder at the chicken's back. Uh, about that level you can see there with it at the back. Here's a waterer and here's a feeder. You will have some hens that just take this feed and throw it all over the floor and that can be really frustrating. Uh, you know, you don't want them stepping in the water, that's why you want it at least that high. And you don't want it too low, like this feeder. Uh, could be raised up a little bit where the chickens are just throwing, uh, pecking and throwing a lot of feed and wasting a lot. So, But good average rule of thumb is that you have it right at their back levels. For disease control, clean, clean, clean is always the best option. Uh, make your coop easy for you to clean out. Uh, when the birds are out during the day, uh, about every other week, a, a little pump sprayer with a little bleach and water in it, it goes a long way. You can really easily just spray down your chicken coop, know that you've killed all the mites and all the bacteria that might be around. Coccidiosis is probably one of our biggest challenges in, in flocks. Uh, you know, I don't know 
if many of you have heard about the salmonella outbreak that we had not too long ago, but there was, what, 36, 37 different cases of salmonella where kids and, and uh, people that were messing with the new chicks that they bought uh, actually came down with salmonella, and it all kind of got linked back to a hatchery. Uh, salmonella is one of those diseases that's that's kind of already in the birds and and uh, can be passed to humans, um, and it and it comes a lot from if you're getting chicks. If you think about kids and how they handle chicks, they've got their hands all over them, they're nestling them up against their mouth and up against their face and cheeks. Really encourage your kids if they're playing with the chickens to wash their hands well. But we didn't and truly have a salmonella outbreak, and and um, it was because people were buying chicks uh, from a reputable uh, breeder, and I think they've since uh, had all their chicks vaccinated and so forth. But salmonella is something that can be there. Uh, that's more in the birds um, than actually than actually just always on the ground that can be in the eggs. But uh, the coccidiosis is kind of that that, uh, that little disease that the birds can get where they have uh, something going on uh, where the coccidiosis starts tearing up their their gut and uh, is not a good situation either. So a lot of cleanliness needs to be had even around these backyard chickens. Um, molting, let's see, do I have, yeah, the molting, let me go back. This is one of my birds, um, or actually one of my son's birds. I think this bird is, uh, we put little blue twist ties on their legs, um, or zip ties on their legs for identification, uh, which is a great thing <laughs> to tell the, the birds apart, because while you may have them told apart when they're babies, they get really hard when they're adults. Um, Anyway, this is a bird that's molting. Once a year, the birds will molt. They'll lose their feathers. It can get really nasty. Uh, they're prone to sunburn at this time. Uh, there's, you just have to really look up some things to help out with that molting process. Birds are going to lose their feathers. Typically at that time, they slow down their egg production. Um, it can be very frustrating um, because on one hand, they're not producing eggs. They should be growing feathers. Um, and then on the other hand, um, maybe your birds are producing eggs and molting and they just cannot meet their nutritional requirement to start ever start growing feathers. Um, this bird here, for some reason, six months, uh, that bird's been molting and just cannot get her over it. Uh, getting your chicks, uh, I'm not going to go into too much about the chicks. Caring for your new chicks. Uh, every time, every little uh, thing you can read about chicks is true. It's a body warmth type situation. And there again, uh, there's certain temperatures they need to be at. You need a heat light, keep them warm. They don't have a great ability to regulate their body temperature, and that's one of the biggest things that, that you need to consider when you have chicks. Then real quick on the meat birds, um, the meat birds go quick. When you get the chicks, you're looking at, and I would I would suggest you look at, at uh, trying to get your birds to to hit that 10 month, I mean sorry, 10 week or so, uh, at least 10 week period, um, because if you if you shoot for birds that you don't have 10 weeks, if you shoot for a shorter uh, growing or a shorter day length. Let me back up. Um, what I mean to say is that uh, there's a lot of breeds out there that mature really quick uh, and, and are great for our industry situations. However, in our backyard situations, like I said before, in the mountains, you're really trying to pick a, a meat bird that will finish out. Uh, I'd say you shoot for that four or five month window uh, when that bird should be ready. Um, if you go, if you back it up, I mean there's some birds that that'll finish out meat wise at three months. But that's really pushing those birds uh, really hard. And so um, that would that's just kind of my one suggestion on the meat birds. 
the other thing is really have your slaughter uh, situation set up and ready. There's, you want to be out of the meat business uh, real quick. Uh, go through the slaughter process once with some meat birds and because you thought they were going to be a good idea. All of a sudden you get everybody together and you go through this process and realize that it is a challenge. Um, and you may never want to do it again. So think about this slaughter process. Uh, cones make it easy um, to drain the, bird, the blood in the birds. Cones also kind of help the birds from flopping around as much. Uh, do some studying. There's some humane ways to go about killing the bird, um, more so than just putting its neck on the chopping block. And, and so you can think about that a lot. Scalding, at least 140 degrees, between 140 and 150 degrees on your water bath. Um, uh, makes that pulling the feathers off a lot easier. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than the bird that's been overcooked or over scalded and you get the skin start to tear or under scalded because uh, your water wasn't hot enough and you can't hardly get the feathers off, off cleanly. Um, the defeather or the plucker is a huge thing. They come in tub pluckers. A lot of times they even put them on drills uh, for people. And uh, But really these rubber uh, these rubber teeth, really gentle on the, the chicken, but they strip the feathers really quick. In about three seconds or four seconds, you can have a whole bird defeathered. It makes it a lot easier than trying to do it by hand. Uh, you can see this guy here. He's uh, got the chicken uh, on the rotary plucker, and uh, all the feathers are coming right off. Have you a nice clean table to do your evisceration. Um, and uh, something that's really clean that you can deal with and then um, after you've eviscerated and cleaned out the chicken um, then um, then really get that bird in some cold ice water uh, or not not even ice water but in some some a cool temperature as fast as you can to get that body temperature and that meat cooled down to a refrigeration level as quick as possible so you don't have a lot of bacterial growth on the on the skin of the bird so, I know I flew through that at the end, but gosh, I looked at the time and we're already there. So, management's doing the right things at the right times. Uh, there's tons of information, tons of, of uh, educational materials out there on the websites. And uh, for sure, uh, backyardchickens.com, that's a great one. You can find all sorts of information that you want. Or you can always call me uh, at the Extension Office here in Gunnison. So, I think we have, Ruth, do we have one more question for them and then we can start doing chat and I'll try to, so if everybody could, uh, before you get off here, if you could just go ahead and, and um, answer some of these questions. I know for some it was kind of basic and, and, uh, and for some it was, was really advanced. So, it's kind of one of those hard things trying to tackle the topic of of uh, chicken production all in one hour here at lunch. So, um, so with that, I'm going to go back up and try to start answering some of these questions. Okay. So here first, how many eggs? So Jane asks, how many eggs per day per chicken? Uh, depends. Um, but typically, um, you can count on one egg a day out of your chickens. Um, typical, typical uh, hen will lay probably 200 eggs a year uh, is, is about right. They're not going to lay as many during that molting process and they may skip some. Older chickens, once they get past three or four years old, they start slowing down as well. The prime chicken producer is that that bird that's under under four years of age. Uh, one of my young hens was laying small eggs with cracked shells but has now stopped laying altogether. Um, she is a low hen on the totem pole and doesn't get as much food as the other birds. Uh, should we feed her more separately to encourage laying? Uh, could stress be keeping her from laying? 
Um, yeah, right off the bat, I'm going to say that stress is keeping her from laying. The others may be pecking on her. If she's not getting the nutrition she needs, she will stop. Uh, that's a big trigger. Um, if they're not getting the nutrition, they'll stop laying. Uh, the, the shells that, that were not fully formed, that could be a nutritional thing as well. Um, so definitely think about maybe uh, feeding her separately. Um, or, you know, I'll be pretty honest, uh, um, but I'm pretty hard at the same time. I just say go get another chicken and uh, replace them. Um, or replace them the next year coming up because they can they can they can start to take a lot of your time up um, let's see so Jane asked what was the reference to preferred diet um, there's not a preferred diet in my mind um, you know I I think the nutritional companies do a very good job of providing a fully nutritional uh, all-inclusive feed for the birds uh, so I sure recommend a lot of people sticking with those but on the same at the same time feel free to be feeding your chickens a few scraps I usually try to steer people away from feeding a lot of meat products um, although it is acceptable if it's cooked meat uh, you sure don't want to get your your chickens sick um, if you'll eat it um, Chances are a chicken will eat it. A couple things we want to steer away from are, are gassy foods like beans and, and, um, and some things like that. But for the most part, chickens, they'll eat anything, even themselves. So, And I'm always a fan for a variety of diet. Uh, if they'll go out and eat some of my weeds, I'm happy for that. Uh, they'll, eat, they'll finish off an ear of corn quick. I'm happy to feed them that. Um, you know, but I always have that nutritional uh, maintained ration right next to them that they can always get. Um, what would some reasons be that my chickens stop laying eggs? The biggest one is uh, stress. Either stress induced from uh, them starting to molt. The molting usually happens as, as uh, part of a day length or a seasonal um, uh, change in the, the amount of sunlight that's available. So when, when your chickens start molting, their bodies will go through a stress period where they can't meet the demand of uh, trying to produce new feathers and, and, um, and keeping up with egg production, so they'll stop laying. Another thing, if, if some other hens are really mean to one and stress it out, they'll stop laying. Uh, typically, they come back um, and lay at some point, though. I was recently reading where chickens like perching on branches of trees. Is this, is that why this perch is being designed in a horizontal mode? If a tree shape is uh, mimicked, then should a canopy be creating or resembling foliage? Um, you know, you bet. Uh, I think perches, I think everything really and truly should somewhat be what you want them to be like. I don't know that a perch, one way or the other, uh, matters to a bird as long as it has somewhere to get up and get off the floor uh, they love to yeah if they were out in the wild they'd be up in trees uh, and that's mainly to stay away from the foxes and, and everything else it's kind of their safe haven they like to get up high, as high as they can in the coops and um, so that's why we have perches uh, in our another thing on our mountain climates and the extreme colds you know, I found that two by fours are kind of your best perches. Uh, just be and lay them flat. The reason we're laying them flat is that uh, when it's really cold, it you can have some frostbite on the feet and toes of chickens. And at least if that they have enough surface area, like a like four inches or so on a board, uh, more so than like the little twigs and round dowels. Uh, if they can get their feet flat and get their bodies all the way over their feet, then their feet stay a lot warmer. Uh, and, and, and can be a lot better for them. Now, as far as, uh, you know, we've probably bred most of the wild out of all the chickens, but as far as it making a difference if it's in a canopy or, or uh, mimicking a tree, I really don't have a lot of information on that as far as chicken behavior goes. But, um, but I, I, 
there again, I think all those structures that are in your coop, whether you um, whether you have um, whether you have pallets uh, out in your your coop that make little stairs that birds get on, um, you know whether you have that or you have a, a tree branches all throughout your coop, you know just make sure that it's easy to clean and and uh, and you're happy with it and then you should your chickens will probably be happy with it. Um, Let's keep going. What temperature does a coop need to be kept in the winter? Uh, you know, once you start getting below zero, then the birds probably are getting stressed a little bit. Um, I like to keep mine no lower than zero, but when we have negative 30 degree nights, my coop will, I have a thermometer and it's always good to have a little digital thermometer in your coop so you can monitor the temperature. Um, you know, when it starts dropping into those 30 degree below zero nights, I'll go out there and put an extra little heat lamp or something like that in their coop. Uh, but that's not to say that my coop hasn't gotten to negative 20 before and the birds were fine. Um, but if you're going that low, you really need to be protecting those combs, getting some Vaseline, um, some type of coating on those the combs and the wattles and so forth. Any of that extra skin that the chicken has that's exposed will truly frostbite. Uh, and that, that's got to be painful for them. Um, some of my hens have lost feathers to rooster activity. Are they at risk for cold this winter? <laughs> If they don't replace the feathers, they could be. It depends to what extent that, that they've lost their feathers. Um, if you have roosters pecking at them a lot and really do a lot of the back feathers uh, are gone, then, then yeah. And, you know, the chickens will grow the new feathers, but it may take a while. Um, there again, I suggest, you know, put some good Vaseline or something over that. Uh, keep it conditioned. You don't want that skin cracking and, and getting uh, and getting uh, uh, dried out on you. And then at, on the flip side, also you have uh, always try to put a little more warmth in there if your chickens aren't fully feathered out, um, and that'll help help. And maybe that's just an extra little light up near the roost um, that can go a long ways. Is this a homemade scalder? Uh, the one that was in the picture, I think, was a homemade scalder. Um, it just had a uh, element in it that came off of a hot water heater. Uh, then they had a temperature gauge to make sure that they were getting it to the right temperature, um, if that helps. But they make all sorts of scalders. Um, that was just, yeah, I think that was a styrofoam cooler with a, with a hot water element in it that they could plug in. Um, what was the red bag on the back of the cow? Uh, that that uh, That's a fun slide for me. Um, I don't know if Ruth can go back to that slide, but that last, that's a methane. A guy was, was, was figuring out what he could do with methane production. And so uh, he actually had a tube inside that cow producing methane that he could go and and take that methane out of the bag and, and I think eat his house or developed a way to do that. But um, So that's what that bag was. Um, then Okay, how do you tell which hens are laying? Uh, I've got 10 chickens. Um, just a lot of observation. Uh, there's not a great way to tell, um, and I'll. I don't guess I've figured that out. I mean, I know that my Wilsomer lays a big terracotta pretty egg. She outproduces all the others. I can tell that egg from the others. Um, usually, an egg will. I have a lot of the black hens, and they. I've got one that'll produce a speckled egg, and I know which one that is. But it is lots of. Uh, um, 
lots of observing to know which one lays what. And you may have to catch them on the nest, uh, but other than that, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. And with that, unless I missed any, uh, one quick thing to think about. I don't know how many of you know which, uh, which end of the egg comes out of the chicken first. Uh, you all know that an egg is not perfectly oval. And there's a flat side and there's, this, there's a tapered side. So um, if you ever wondered which end of the egg comes out first, a lot of people think it's the skinny side but in actuality it's the flat, the bigger side. That way the cloaca can, can seal off as that egg comes out and you have less chance of bacteria getting up in that, that chicken. So with that, that's my last bit of information. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, and also down in that, if you have any questions ever, just feel free to call me. Um, I'm always available to anybody uh, that has chicken questions. So thank you very much.